Hello friends, welcome to the STIR and volume two of our Shelter in Place series, or SIP for short. I'm your host, Trish Moiko Tobin. And joining me as always is a woman I'd shave my legs for. As a matter of fact, I did, <laughs> which is rare uh, in this well, day and age. Now you put me in an awkward position. <laughs> She is my binge bestie. She is author, columnist, TV producer, Debbie Baldwin. Hey, Deb. Hey, Trish. <laughs> so how are things at the Baldwin household still getting along? Uh, well, you know, everyone is still standing. It's <laughs> that's the best <laughs> update I can give you. The laundry is mounting. The paper towels are diminishing. I feel like, you know, especially with the Zoom uh, method, that you know, I'm, I'm calling out to the outside world for help. Like we're down to the end of our last supplies. <laughs> and you've been out this longer. I mean, since we are broadcasting from St. Louis, just so you know, this is the first week of a statewide stay at home order, but we've been under a stay at home order in the city and county for about three weeks now for Deb even longer, about a month or so now, right Deb? Because one of your college kids was a study abroad student. So you've had right. to quarantine for a little longer. <laughs> yes, so we've been climbing the walls the for a month. on your face says it all. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and so here we are, Debbie and I are more than happy to assist you in procuring uh, the very best of at-home entertainment. In fact, Debbie has really gotten it down to an art. I'm just writing her coattails here. So... Last week, Deb, our discussion centered on what was out there in TV, cable, and streaming land. This week's topic, I have to say, had us both in a tizzy. I mean, we're going to talk specifically about binge-worthy actors. And when I proposed this to you, I could pretty much see you drooling at the prospect. <laughs> well, I mean, it's easy to come up with, like, binge-worthy bodies of work, like, Mel Brooks movies or Alfred Hitchcock movies or the Monty Python series. I mean, we could go on and on and on, but, um, it, um, to get, come up with a single actor, you know, aside from these obvious, you know, you and I talked about not, you know, calling off the top of the, the obvious choices. Exactly. So these actors who have these tremendous bodies of work, but that maybe don't pop into your head right away when you're thinking about doing like a movie fest, you know, a movie marathon night. Exactly. I mean, we're talking about already, um, not for discussion, because you and I pretty much agree, Tom Hanks, Tom Cruise, uh, Meryl Streep, Julia Roberts. Robert De Niro. Is Eastwood, Robert De Niro, yeah. Will Smith even. Um, yeah. You know, those are actors who've been around for decades now and, and you're right, they have a good body of work. So I'm really curious about what kind of criteria you abided by when you came up with your list. To me, the main question was always, could I stand spending all day watching this person? And so my inner dialogue was a debate about, does this actor, man or woman, have to be attractive or appealing to me to be binge-worthy? Or would the sheer quality of the good acting be enough to hold my interest? Uh, I'm really curious about your criteria. Right. And I think for me, it's all about talent. I mean, you take an actor like, you know, a Steve Buscemi or Benicio Del Toro, who, you know, while arguably handsome, are not handsome in the traditional movie star sense of the word. Exactly. But they're so talented that I could really watch almost any movie they're in. So the way I kind of structured our list here, because we did compare lists before the show, you know, the, the thing about the good looking, good actor debate, case in point, in one of your movie review columns way back when, I remember this because it was a thought you posed that made me go, hmm, you were talking about the Jason Bateman, Ryan, Ryan, Ryan Reynolds movie, The Change Up. And you said something like, Ryan Reynolds is so good looking, you forget he's a good actor. And Jason Bateman is such a good actor and you forget that he's good looking. So this was kind of like the conundrum I was faced with. And um, like you said, um, they don't have to be 
handsome in the classical sense. Um, you know, I mean, I'm in love with John Travolta, you know, those kinds of people. Buscemi is a great actor and I love to watch him. Um, so yeah, you, you're right about that. Um, and you know, there's a joke on Modern Family where uh, Mitchell Pritchett has a crush on um, Rob Lowe. And <laughs> he says at one point that he's very talented, that he thinks his looks may have held him back. And I kind of chuckled at that line, but as I was coming up with my list, one of my actors for binging is Bradley Cooper. And boy, for a guy who is just, you know, textbook handsome, cover, magazine cover, model. My gorgeous. goodness, yes. He we could has, do a show about how handsome Bradley Cooper is. Yeah, totally. <laughs> Stop me now, right? Um, but my God, his list of films, I mean, Oscar, 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 it's, he's incredibly talented. Maybe his looks have been holding back, or maybe not, because he's made all these amazing films. But um, yeah, we've got, I definitely have some eye candy on my list, <laughs> but not all of it. <laughs> okay, so speaking of eye candy, this man was both on our list, and definitely good looking, you know, Keanu Reeves, my goodness. Keanu, the debate is there. Is, is it because he looks like Keanu or because there's some, some acting chops behind all that pretty face? He is an interesting guy because I think a lot of people would argue that he is not a great actor. I would argue that he has a great agent because <laughs> he lands amazing projects and I would watch tons of Keanu Reeves movies. I mean, even the John Wick movies, which weren't like, you know, I mean, they aren't considered like the action cream of the crop, but I really like them. So and you would they, add the John Wick movie on your Keanu list? I would put the John Wick movie. Um, I haven't seen the third one, but I, yeah. would, I would put the trilogy on my list. The Matrix, obviously. The Matrix. Feather in his cap. I mean, that, it's just one of the greatest movies of all time. And how about the goofier Keanu stuff, like Bill and Ted? <laughs> you know, which does, I don't know if it holds up, um, but I will say that uh, without exception, my absolute favorite Keanu Reeves movie is The Replacements, where oh. he plays a washed up college quarterback who lost a huge bowl game in total humiliation and Gene Hackman recruits him to be a strike-breaking replacement player when the NFL goes on strike. And the movie stars, I mean, it just has an incredible John Favreau's in it. Yes, um, it was a great Gene cast. Gene Hackman, and it is one of the most underrated films. It's one of those stand-up and cheer movies, but it is also one of those laugh out loud, just great fun movies. It's one of those movies that if it's on cable, I will always stop and watch it. Well, one of the Keanu movies that I'm glad you mentioned that I think that is just so, so appealing to me. I'm drawn to it. And one of the movies I will definitely stop whatever I'm doing is Something's Gotta Give with Diane yeah. Keaton and Jack, Jack Nicholson. Nicholson. And Keanu as the Keaton. doctor. Oh my gosh. Yeah, Hello. That's a fantastic movie. I mean, people say like, oh, that movie's worth watching for the house alone to see that beach house. <laughs> but um, yeah, that is an incredible, incredible movie. And every single actor in it, I could, you could, I could binge, uh, do a Diane Keaton movie marathon. I could do a Jack Nicholson movie marathon. I mean, it's, that's a classic, no question. So moving right along with our good looking, good actor, Ryan Gosling. He, I mean, for a guy, again, who's, I would not describe him as a traditionally handsome guy, but is, in my opinion, the best looking actor in Hollywood. I mean, he just has a face that you could take home at for hours and hours and hours. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, obviously he's tremendously talented. You yeah. look at a movie, like, I mean, La La Land, obviously this is, Latest and greatest, but for me, Crazy Stupid Love is my favorite movie of his, um, other than the one other written by um, Bo Willimon, who 
created oh, yes. House of Cards is uh, the film The Ides of March. Ides of March with Clooney. With George Clooney. That was a great movie as well. Yes. And yes. I agree with you about Crazy Stupid Love, um, Gosling being kind of creepy cool. I love that um, with him. And would you add the notebook to that list? I would add the notebook to that list. I mean, it's not my favorite movie, but <laughs> I mean, I can remember when that movie came out and the, you know, 15 year old girls were going to see like I you know there hasn't been a movie like that in a long time where you would go and sit through one or two runnings of it you know like we you know leave and go grab lunch and then go out and go back <laughs> to the theater to watch it again and yeah and that, other than like the Star Wars movies that has an added much and then Ryan Gasling was in another film which is a bit older uh called The Believer which if you haven't seen that no, I have not. Uh, it's an v- incredible film based on a true story um, about a young uh, Jewish kid who becomes a neo-Nazi. And it's, I mean, a very compelling performance and a very um, riveting film about... Okay, so that's one I'm going to have to add to my list. As I was coming up, you know, with our list here to talk about on the show, I was thinking we can't talk about Ryan Gosling without mentioning his frequent co-star, who is Emma Stone, of course, with Crazy Stupid Love and uh, La La Land. But on her own with her movies, would you consider her binge-worthy? Yes, I would. Um, Okay. You know, I used to kind of joke that Emma Stone must thank the heavens every day that Lindsay Lohan's career imploded. (laughs) I mean, that's maybe harsh, but, you know, she stepped right into that very talented, redheaded, awesome yeah. role. Like, that is true. You have a good point right there. I do like her. Uh, Easy A is very watchable. A, I love to watch that movie. Uh, mean Girls. Um, yeah, she's. And uh, would you add the favorite to this list? One of her more recent yes. ones. A bit heavy, but still comedic. But um, yeah. Yeah. She was great in it. Um, and so. Th- the other night, there was an Emma Stone movie. It's a kind of rare movie. Um, it's the Woody Allen movie, Magic in the Moonlight with Colin Firth. Yes. Which That's made me think. Mm-hmm. Yes. So which made me think of Colin Firth. I, he would be near the top of my list. What about you? I, absolutely. He is a very incredibly charming actor. So interesting to watch. I love all of his movies. Another one I would stop everything I'm doing and just watch. I am mesmerized by him. Yeah. I mean, from Bridget Jones's Diary to Love Ashley to his more serious roles, The King's Speech. Yeah. And I'm like, God, am I mixing him up with someone? <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> did I just say the wrong guy? No, no, <laughs> no. I that's I him, like, but I mean, I would even add Mamma Mia to that. Completely. I mean, I mean, he is so lovely to watch. (laughs) (laughs) So moving right along from Colin Firth, his fellow British actor, Bridget Jones, nemesis. um, Definitely another yes for me. I don't know what you think about him, but it's Hugh Grant. Uh, Love Hugh Grant. I mean, he, he almost to me was born in like the wrong era. (laughs) <laughs> he, you know, could have been one of those 50s. I wouldn't say he has the greatest range as an actor, but he plays that kind of charming, ne'er-do-well, um, coming-of-age man, you know, with a palm. He's, I, He's perfect for such roles, kind of like the Jane Austen uh, movies, uh, Four Weddings and a Funeral, uh, Florence Foster Jenkins with Meryl Streep. I thought he was great in it. But I also love, and again, it's, you know, the movies with Julia Roberts with Not- Notting Hill. Um, About a boy. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, even music and lyrics with Drew Barrymore. I just love him as the 80s pop star. It's and wonderful. I would say that with maybe next to maybe Four Weddings and a Funeral, which I think is his best film, um, music and lyrics is maybe <laughs> one of those films that slipped under the radar for a lot of people, but it stars Hugh Grant and Drew Barrymore. Um, he, Hugh is an aging pop star. And he is the, um, the, the fictional equivalent of, um, of, wham. The, of wham, of the, yeah. of the less <laughs> successful half of wham, who kind of got lost in the shuffle. And it's trying to make a comeback. And Drew Barrymore plays his plant lady in his apartment who comes by and waters his plants. 
and has just this sort of natural ability to write song lyrics and they, you know, fall in love. It's just a, that's just a great, charming, really funny movie. Very well written. I'm I completely agree. Movie. It's such a sweet story. The songs that came out of that movie are wonderful. I mean, it does remind you a little bit of some of those 80s videos. And, you know, he even has a, <laughs> uh, <laughs> A trademark <laughs> move is his dance. <laughs> yeah, he, he, he can't do anymore because his back is bad. It's I, I, I just love that movie. It's actually it's been in my um, in my direct TV queue for some time. I can't bear to to delete it. It's always there whenever I need you know a little Hugh Grant fix. Same with um, Love Actually. It's it's never going to be deleted. Notting Hill, same thing. But uh, yeah, again, it might be the accent you know with him and Colin Firth. I don't know. But um, we mentioned Florence Foster Jenkins, and, you know, of course, his co-star was Meryl Streep. Meryl, definitely a given for us. I think, though, for me, um, in terms of being bingeable for Meryl, her more lighter films uh, would be a little bit more appealing to me if I were to do a Meryl Streep marathon all day. I mean, it would take a month. I... Her butt. It's so funny. Like, I mean, I'm looking up these actors, and, and like I want to talk to you about, and you think, oh, like you know, I love Queen Latifah. Let's look up her. You know, and I jot down her ten films so yeah. that are my favorites, or you know, Bradley Cooper, and I jot down his ten films. Then you Google, you know, plug in Meryl Streep. <laughs> it's like scrolling, scrolling, <laughs> scrolling. I mean, I could jot down my top ten. Oscar nominated roles. Exactly. I mean, that's the problem with actresses like her with such a vast um, filmography. So you did mention Queen Latifah. I thought, hey, that's um, for out of left field. But I do love her in the movies. What are some of the movies that's tops on your list for her? Uh, my favorite movie of hers is The Last Holiday, without question. Gerard is, Depardieu. Yes. And it's <laughs> the story of a woman who gets bad information she gets a misdiagnosis of terminal cancer and so she takes her whole life savings and she takes off to the French Riviera I think it is or Monaco or so and um somewhere in Europe has this devil may care you know um, uh, you know last days on earth vacation which of course is she's not dying but um and it's just a funny charming film and she really pulls it off so well. I mean, she's just wonderful to watch her. I mean, she's such a beautiful woman and such a yes. fantastic actress. And she was great in that film. And to add Gerard Depardieu as the chef, wee oui, wee, oui, my goodness. I mean, that was, oh, yeah. that was, that was a great, great um, combination. She was also in um, Chicago, of course. Um, fantastic. I would add that to her, uh, to the Queen Latifah list. She was in Beauty Shop, Secret Life of Bees. And a more recent trip, can't forget girls' trip. Yes, <laughs> um, she was in Jungle Fever, the Spike Lee film. I, oh, mean, I had forgotten about that. The, uh, the Bone Collector. I mean, she's another, she's a woman who has a tremendous amount of range. I mean, she's gone, she's done some very serious, um, you know, quality dramas and then some just over the top fantastic comedies, bringing down the house with Steve Martin. Yeah, I mean, she's really got a broad based body of work with lo in lots of genres. So speaking of someone with range and perhaps uh, we don't think of her um, off the top of our head because she is such a great comedic actress and it's only fairly recently that that we've really seen her range as Melissa McCarthy. Melissa McCarthy and she hasn't you know she doesn't have the body of work that a lot of of you know binge movie marathon actors have but man you want some really funny films if and I almost I started laughing out loud to myself as I was jotting down <laughs> my list of her films because you sort of forget that oh she was in this one she was in this one she was in this exactly. one exactly and um I mean it's the heat which with Sandra Bullock where you know they're um Sandra Bullock's the uh, FBI agent. Yes. And she's <laughs> I'm laughing her. already just thinking about it. I mean, just that one, every scene in that movie makes me smile just thinking about it. Well, and, and of course, Bridesmaids, which she pretty much steals the show. I mean, <laughs> that scene on the airplane when she suspects that that man is the 
air marshal. Who is her real life husband, who by the way. Her real life husband is. The fact that that is the case, it makes it even more hilarious. I mean, <laughs> oh my God. Don't forget Spy, Trish, which is her other, yes. you know, big comic. That's right. Where, you know, she gets, <laughs> becomes a field agent as opposed to, you know, gets taken away from her desk job at her, you know, government agency to become a field agent. And I mean, right. every scene in that movie is hilarious. Yes, I, I did stars love Rose Byrne, her bridesmaids co-star. Yeah. Those women, there's a lot of, of overlap in a lot oh, of definitely. really funny female-driven comedies. Definitely. Um, more recently, though, she was in Can You Ever Forgive Me, which was a little bit of a departure for her, but my goodness, she definitely took him that role with gusto. She was I great. agree. I thought that was a great performance and that was a really interesting movie. Yeah. And so one of Melissa's Bridesmaids co-stars is Maya Rudolph, who made your list. I love Maya Rudolph. I mean, from her SNL days to, she made an independent film with John Krasinski, if um, any anyone tuning in is a fan of John Krasinski from The Office, this movie called Away We Go. Oh, is okay. One of the funniest, most charming films. Maya Rudolph and John Krasinski play a young married couple, and they unexpectedly get pregnant, and they decide that they're going to travel around the country and visit their friends that have kids and see, like, prepare themselves for life with a child. Okay, and I love that setup. I, I must admit, I wasn't familiar with this movie, but you got me really curious. I mean, I won't, don't want to give too much away because it, from the opening scene to the roll, when the credits roll, it is just funny, clever, charming. The, obviously, Maya Rudolph and John Krasinski are two incredibly likable actors. I love them both, yes. So, yeah. Okay. All right. Ads. So add another one to my list. And so we mentioned Saturday Night Live. So let's talk about some of the funny guys who've gone on to have even bigger careers in the movies. Uh, both tops on our list, uh, Bill Murray. Um, Bill Murray was the top of my list, actually. And Will Ferrell was number two. Yeah. <laughs> um, I like a comedy, especially in this climate. Um, yeah. Yeah. Bill Murray obviously has a much broader body of work than Will what Ferrell. would you say is your favorite Bill Murray movie? Um, well, I mean, I'm looking at the list right now because I can't, I don't think I could shoot. I'd have to say a Caddyshack. Oh, <laughs> I mean, okay. I have to say one of his classic comedies, Stripes, Ghostbusters, Groundhog Day. Yes. Fantastic performance. I mean, um, I adored Lost in Translation, but it's a kind yeah. of movie. Some people didn't like it at all. Um, I loved it. I think um, the fact that it was Bill Murray made me like that movie. Um, I don't think I would have really liked that movie if he wasn't in it. Um, I believe, though, my favorite Bill Murray movie is What About Bob? With love, Richard Dreyfus. <laughs> Richard Dreyfus and Julie Haggerty. And, um, you know, he plays a um, therapy patient with severe separation anxiety and attaches himself to his therapist's family. And the therapist is played by Richard Dreyfus, And they're just, he is just the perfect foil. <laughs> um, you know, Bill Murray he keeps showing up everywhere. They can't get rid of him, but the family loves him. Yeah. And Richard Dreyfus is trying to draw these boundaries and can't get Bill Murray out of his life. Um, no, that movie is hilarious. And then, and, my, and probably my favorite, um, and it is a comedy as well, but it's a little more, I don't want to say legit, it's a more, has more gravitas would be the Royal Tenenbaums. Oh, yes. <laughs> Bill Murray has a small role in, but if, you, you know, you, your listeners have not seen the Royal Tenenbaums, it is one of the greatest movies I just think it's everything about it is phenomenal. It's hilarious and it's smartly written. And you're right. I mean, again, he just, um, he morphs so much into that role. <laughs> I, I, I just love it. So from Bill Murray to Will Ferrell, uh, you know, 
again, you're not going to get an argument from me about Will Ferrell. Um, Anchorman is probably on the top of my list for him. So are his movies with John C. Riley, like Ricky Bobby and Step Brothers. Um, what would you say um, is, is tops on your list in terms of uh, Ferrell movies? Um, you know, I'd say Elf. Oh, yes. I totally forgot about that, too. You're right. Yeah. Yes. You know, my kids, every time they see, like, you know, either a GIF or um, some reference to him pulling the gum off of the banister of the of the subway entrance in New York City and popping it in his mouth, um, <laughs> there's just always some elf reference that is relevant in our house. But um, he um, also made a movie with Kevin Hart called Get Hard. Yeah. Um, about a, um, he's a wealthy guy and he's being sent to jail for some white collar crime. And he hires Kevin Hart to prepare him for prison life. And I mean, it's. He's cool. another one that is just too funny for his own good. And just the physical aesthetic of those two with wow. Will so tall and Kevin so little. Absolutely. Um, it's, it's <laughs> yeah, that was a, a funny movie. But so I mean, from Will Ferrell, yeah, go ahead. Like it goes on and on, old school. Um, old school. Luke Wilson and Vince Vaughn and Vince, Vince Vaughn's another bingeable guy. Um, okay, so you had him on your list. He's another one of those guys where I'm on the fence about him. Um, I do like some of his movies, but tell me why Vince Vaughn is on your list. You know, I just have always liked him. He's uh, a funny, charming actor. I mean, from Wedding Crashers, that whole film, and he does well in that role of, of um, victim, like the guy who's getting be beaten up. I would put and, quotation marks around that victim because that... Well, you know what I mean, though. He's the guy who's always getting, like, the bad stuff is happening to him. And um, he, yeah. And he um, is just so perfect in that role. And he keeps wanting to leave. And, you know, Owen Wilson wants to stay. And... Um, I mean, Isla Fisher, who plays the redheaded kind of Betty girl, is just perfect. I mean, that, that movie is... Yeah, that was a great movie. And of course, you know, that was when we started seeing Bradley Cooper, too, because he was, he was the bad guy he in is that movie. He say who gets the eye drops in his water. And a lot of people don't know that. Like, when we say that, Brad, that was Bradley Cooper. It wasn't his first role. Right. If you've seen Wet Hot American Summer... <laughs> no, he's been trying to make it for a long time. For a long time. For a but, long time. Yes. So I was going to say, you know, Wedding Crashers, a Dodgeball, with the, the breakup with Jennifer Aniston. Those are like a few that I'm thinking about that are making the rounds on cable right now. So they're pretty easily accessible. Um, so yeah, I, I agree with you. I can see myself binge watching his movies. I don't know if because I think he's a good actor or I'm just drawn to that, like that smart ass personality you were talking about. Most definitely not my type in the look department though. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I think he's an appealing looking guy. He's not, you know, a traditionally handsome movie star, nor is John Favreau, his sort of partner in crime. Um, See, I mean, you're mentioning some of these movies I haven't even thought of, but you're right. I mean, he, Vince Vaughn is that kind of guy where, where the list is pretty long and you're going to have to um, kind of sort through and see which movies you want on that binge list. Another one that, you know, we're talking about actors who are really not handsome in the classical sense, but to me, I mean, this guy was an automatic on my list, John Cusack, from his 80s movies on. Um, I've just... There is something about that man, and I think the fact that he is also very, very conscious about the music and the songs that he includes in this move in his movies that um, really resonate with me. And before we move on, the John Favreau Vince Vaughn movie is called Swingers, and it's about Swingers. Um, a young single guys living in LA, and it's hilarious. If yes, it is. The, the dialogue between the two now. Interestingly enough, we all think of those like 80s comedies, Say Anything, The Sure Thing. Um, you know, John Cusack was in 16 Candles. He was He's in 16 in Candles. Jumped in the trunk of the car. He's been in the business a long time. If you're looking for a fantastic um, psychological thriller, he made a movie called Identity. 
which I have seen that is about a group of people who get reined in in a stuck in a hotel during a horrible storm and it's people are being killed off one by one and I don't want to say too much but it's really worth watching There's okay a- yes I have seen that and I did love him in that also one of the best Cusack films I think is um, High Fidelity love High Fidelity and Jack Black in that movie I mean I love Cusack but Jack Black stole that show from him <laughs> It's based on the novel by Nick Hornby. The, yeah. It's a great, great film. No Definitely. Problem. So and, Q's, and or, Con Air is another one that's a little off the beaten path, but, you know, um, was very entertaining to me. And his co-star in that movie was Nicolas Cage when they were trying to land a plane that was yeah. filled with um, ex con He's the, uh, the law enforcement officer on the other end of the radio. Exactly. Oh, well, you're saying the wrong actor for a second. No, yeah. <laughs> Nicolas Cage, Steve Buscemi. Con Air is a great action film if you haven't seen it. Um, you know, Steve Buscemi is that just chilling serial killer. The psycho that he is, that he uh, can be you know. so very good in playing. <laughs> Well, see, I mean, again, Nicolas Cage, I had a hard time deciding on uh, whether he belonged on my list because with him, his idiosyncrasies, his personality is so overpowering, you either find him irresistible or annoying. What say you? Raising Arizona, which is Joel and Ethan Cohen, is is one of the greatest comedies. I I absolutely, it's It is hilarious, yes. I mean, he, Adaptation, which is another just phenomenal film um, where he plays a screenwriter trying to adapt an unadaptable book, which is, the book is The Orchid Thief, which I don't know if any of, anyone's ever read it. I've read it. It is- That's a great trivia for you. (laughs) You can see that this guy's head is going to explode trying to make this very sort of plotless book into- into a movie and ends up writing this crazy film within a film that is, and Nicolas Cage plays his, himself and plays the character Charlie Kaufman and his, right. his, his twin. And it's just a great movie. Now, the other Nicolas Cage movie, the Nicolas Cage movie that absolutely won my heart, if you've never seen it, is Honeymoon in Vegas. Oh, with yes, of course. <laughs> and James Caan and Nicolas Cage and Sarah Jessica Parker are engaged and they go to Vegas. They're going to get married. And Nicolas Cage ends up losing Sarah Jessica Parker in a poker game to James Caan. And it's all been, you know, manipulated. And, they're, you know, James Caan is sort of the, pup, the, the powerful puppet master of the whole thing. But he right. wants Sarah Jessica Parker for himself. And full comedy and Nicolas Cage plays that frustrated end of his rope kind of guy. Full of angst. Perfectly, yeah. Yes. And even with his heavy films like, um, you know, Leaving Las Vegas. Which is an incredible film. I mean, it's not for everyone. No, it's not. But I think that's when he kind of started, you know, right around the time when you had Leaving Las Vegas and um, Honeymoon in Vegas when he got all caught up in his, his little Elvis obsession. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's about the time he married Lisa Marie Presley. That's right. And, well, and you can't really mention a Nicolas Cage binge list without mentioning Wild at Heart, which is oh, yeah. a great film of his. I mean, he's, a, he's made some clunkers in his career, but he's made some great movies too, and that for sure is one of them. And for his action films, I mean... Would you consider something like his National Treasure series? Um, I like Clunkers, or I liked it. I mean, it's definitely if you have kids who are under the age of maybe thirteen, it's a great uh, family-friendly action film. You think? I think if I have young kids that I'd like to, you know, get a pick out of an action movie that you know wasn't completely full of swear words and full of sex and right i think national treasure is a perfect niche for that it's a good all-purpose movie yes definitely 
um, you know, Face Off with your friend John Travolta. Yeah, Face Off is a great movie. You oh gotta, my gosh, you, those two battle it out. I just love the. You got you have to employ a little, you know, what they call willing suspension of disbelief. <laughs> <laughs> for John Travolta I'm willing to do that <laughs> you know what? you gotta go with it and it's uh, that's a fun movie uh, yeah. 60 seconds with Angelina Jolie I mean oh The Rock with Robert Duvall I mean that's right that's right made a lot of really entertaining films so yeah. yeah so I mean as you guys can see this list is so long and we can go on forever you guys can see why Debbie and I were fit to be tied when it came to a topic like this. I also had some uh, relatively new names to add to the list. Um, I love watching Mahershala Ali talking about, talk about just screen presence. You know, um, we've seen him in Green Book. We've seen him in Hidden Figures, Moonlight. He was so just mesmerizing. Even on TV with True Detective, um, I just thought, you know, he's, he's great. I just love him. What about you? What do you think of him? I, I think he's incredibly talented. I mean, Green Book, I mean, and Viggo Mortensen too. Yeah, he's, he's another one. one. of really quality films. Um, but yeah, and um, you know, the other actor who came to mind, and these are, these actors are relative newcomers, um, is Michael B. Jordan, who yes. so far has made, you know, I don't know how many films he's made in his career so far, but they'd almost all go on my list. He's so talented you know, Fruitvale station and get out. And I mean, it just, incredible. he's another one that you're really drawn to, to yeah. him. Yeah. Yeah. And another one who's, who's fun. And again, she's, she's fairly new. Um, uh, on the scene is Aquafina, the comedian. Yes. I just love watching her from Crazy Rich Asians, which she pretty much stole the, the movie from everyone else with that great ensemble cast, to The Farewell, where she showed you a little bit more of her uh, serious acting chops. Yes, she's going to have a, a, a long career ahead of her. She's very entertaining to watch, and she's made... The few films that she's made so far have all been great. So yeah, no question. Yeah, I mean, like, I was even thinking about Ocean's 8, where she, you know, she had a pretty minor yeah. role, but she held her own against the likes of Kate Blanchett, Sandra Bullock, and Hathaway. So, I mean, yeah, I, I think definitely, and she also has her own uh, TV series called Nora from Queens. I don't know if you've seen that. Oh, I have to check that out. That's yes, great. but Nora is her real name. I think her, her real name is Nora Lum, and so that's where the title come from, comes from, and it's hilarious. So I can see us doing a sequel on just this topic. So definitely there's there's more to discuss and um, we'll be talking about a lot more coming up but before we say goodbye we try to end the show on a little bit of a sweet note and share with you a treat that you can make at home uh, with ingredients stayed out of the pantry last week we had the Algona coffee and deb what's your verdict on that whipped coffee it's delicious it's so easy to make and <laughs> i told you you know, I, I like to tool around in the kitchen. Um, and this was a fun thing. My kids all loved it. It was just sort of um, like making a, um, a homemade cappuccino, but um, over ice, it was, we've been drinking them nonstop. They're great. And it seems very fancy, like you're at a really fancy coffee shop. And you could totally fancy it up if you exactly. were Exactly. <laughs> you know, I've been adding a little bit of cinnamon to it. Um, I'm going to try to add cocoa to it to give it a little more of a chocolate flavor because I'm a chocoholic. Um, so in the last few days, I've been indulging in something called depression cake. It's also known as crazy cake. And now people are beginning to call it quarantine cake. <laughs> and... The idea was during the depression, there was a shortage of uh, milk, butter, and eggs. So this cake has none of that, Deb. It is unbelievable. You use canola oil along with the flour, sugar, and cocoa. And the secret ingredient is a tablespoon of white vinegar. And you can also make icing with it. Same simple ingredients like the cocoa and the sugar um, and some vanilla extract. I love chocolate, and I always make my cakes from scratch. I, I don't do anything from a box, but this one has made me such a believer. I think it's the next one you should try. It's so moist. It's so chocolatey. 
it's definitely something that'll help with those quarantine blues. I'm, I'm literally, I'm trying to figure out if I have white vinegar in my cabinet. As you're talking, I'm like, <laughs> the trying to do a, an inventory of your pantry. <laughs> that sounds amazing. I'm definitely going to give it a try. Yes, um, I, I highly recommend it. Again, you know, it's known in some parts as depression cake, crazy cake, and now some people are calling it quarantine cake. Um, but we're going to put it to the test with uh, Debbie Baldwin and, and her kin. So with that, Happy to help. To, <laughs> I'll say that again. <laughs> yeah, you're going to have to do a taste test because I was completely sold. And again, I'm very critical with my sweets, um, but this one is definitely a winner. So with that, we have to bid adieu. This has been volume two of our sip series on the stir. Debbie, this has been fun as always. Thanks, Trish. Great talking to you. You too. Thank you, Deb, and thank you for joining us. We will see you next time.